five feet of snow, the Yukon still flowed in the cold snap of 1928, and the blue of the snow at 60 below lay fluffed as a ptarmigan's paint. There were sun dogs by day that peeked through the spray of ice crystals swept in from the west, while at night the sky danced with a glory enhanced from burnt paw to alicaquette. Some miners in Gwich'in huddled inside their kitchen round the pot-bellied stove and oak rocker. There was Jerome and his wife, Billy Boy with his lice, Julie and Benji and Walker. They stared at the flames and muttered vile names, keeping their thoughts off of grieving. For Sarah Jean Carroll, who'd caught a buck-laden barrel and fought for her life, barely wheezing. Now all around the fire, they vented their ire, yet the family and guests knew the score. That one had to go plow over the snow from ramparts to Fairbanks. Once more, he had to return with a doctor or learn how a layman could administer aid to a gut that's been sewn with a needle of bone and stitched tight with long hair tied in braids. At first they had waited as though it was fated that Sarah would pull through all right, but the gurgle of blood on her pillow did flood and trickled in streams quite a fright. The planes were all grounded, their skis had been foundered when the cold snap had frozen them tight. Now all that was left, as the planes were bereft, was a long, lonely, cold dog sled ride. They all knew the wager, the price of a savior and the snap of winter's cold whip. Yet they all swore to go like the flight of a crow on this, the most holy of trips. And so they drew straws from Jerome's mighty paw to gamble the privilege to go, to race old man winter with dog sleds and dinter, the crest of the virginal snow. Jerome drew the longest and Benji's was strongest. Walker's was long but was lean. Billy Boy tried to cover his pride when his was the shortest. It seemed that the threat of the trip in winter's stern grip and the perils of trail and of storm gave him no fear and he said with a sneer, by God, but it looks like I've won. Now older men know that the price of the snow is black lips and ice frosted beard. And stopping means lion, and lion means dying, and always Nakani is steered. Through frost heavy woods, over frozen stream floods, to the pant of a dog tired team. It stocks the unwary, the fools are his quarry, as are the crippled, the weak, and the green. But the wheeze from the marrow sank like an arrow, in Billy's heart covered with fur where it throbbed in his chest as it did in her breast, and his need to be off made him stir. From his seat by the fire, in the smoke of the briar, stilling the rage in his soul, he sprang to his feet, this bold athlete, and into the bedroom he strolled. Bending over the bed where the blood trickled red, whistling strains of sweet Molly McGee, he kissed her hot cheeks and nose like a beak, and then he knelt down on his knees for the help of the one who gave his own son as a martyr to those who would care to challenge the wind or the mob's awesome grin and those with the courage to dare. Then he tethered his dogs and fastened his togs with jerky he piled his sled high and he whistled that tune in the light of the moon as the stars twinkled high in the sky. Like a hurricane spire, the northern lights fire filled the sky with green and with rose and Billy Boy gambled with the draw of the bramble with that straw that he broke when he chose. With a yell he was off in the snow and the frost and yet as he vanished from sight it seemed that the flakes an aura did make which encircled him in this wild flight. Then the hush of the wind in winter's grim grin rooted about in the trees 
and the last that they heard, like the wail of a bird, were the strains of sweet Molly McGee. In three days the storm, with the speed of a worm, crawled west toward Gnome's Norton Sound, and a flight from the city on an errand of pity skidded weird on the ice-covered ground. With a doctor aboard for a child who'd been gored by the blast of the gun-cotton beast, but the effort was late, for the child had a date, and at long last her wheezing did cease. Jerome and his wife cried into the night, alone round the pot-bellied fire, for the child that was gone and the hope that was spawned, and now the flames seemed but a pyre. And together they waited to tell of the fated, a task which gave them no joy, to bear bitter tidings to the one who had been driving the dogs, the young Billy boy. For two weeks they waited, and waited, and waited, and Billy Boy still hadn't arrived. And the days they grew longer, and the light ever stronger, and the green buds on the ground did strive to grow through the slush of winter's last muck to reach for the springtime sun. And when the ice broke, neither one spoke, for they knew Billy Boy never come. Now the days of the dogs and wolverine togs are tales of the Northland's twilight, and the roar of the snow goes, shatter the snow, and professors now ponder the lights. But sometimes they say, when the howl and the spray of winter has died in the trees, a phantom sled glides, and a ghost aboard rides, wheezing strains of sweet Molly McGee. Ever hear tell a sweet Molly McGee Came north to Alaska from London Derry With a pack full of whiskey, a shovel and pan To dig for the gold through the muck and the sand Triompoli olo, riompoli am Triompoli olo, riompoli am Lost her first grub stake in a turn of the cards Spent her first winter alone in the dark Took a big clean up in the spring of a three Spent all on a scoundrel who fled the country Triompoli olo riompoli am Triompoli olo riompoli am Settled in Ruby with a Malamute dog Living high on moose steaks and imported hogs Bought up a share of the Irish saloon With whiskey and nuggets she howls at the moon Triompoli olo riompoli am Triampoli, oh, Lori, Ampoli, and...